Adam, pastor of St. Teresa's Parish. On my behalf, I welcome Diane, Gregory, Marshalls, Antoinette, grandchildren, brothers, Tyrone, and Ronnie, to this mass of fish and burial for beloved Marty Barnes. On their behalf, I welcome our mayor, Jeffrey Jones, our Sheriff Richard Burnett, our Public Safety Director Dan Brown, our Police Chief William Fair, our former Mayor Lawrence Pat Kramer, our sons of people, all our dignitaries and dear friends from Marty Barnes who have come here to celebrate this liturgy on behalf of beloved Marty. In the holy wars of baptism, Marty died with Christ and rose with him to a new life and now share with him eternal glory. Let us pray. O God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your Son died and rose again to life. Mercifully landed through this mystery, your servant Marty, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Please be seated. And now Benji Wimberly will proclaim her first meeting.
he proved it. And as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. Those who trust him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love. Because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with his elect. This is the word of the Lord.
newness of life. <clears throat> Are you unaware that when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. If then we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ raised from the dead dies no more. Death no longer the power over him. This is the word of the Lord. Christ and the Eucharist. 
by reading God's Word, the Bible, we study upon that Word, making that Word a part of our daily lives. And by reaching out to help those in need. That's how we prepare ourselves for the final rendezvous when we will be dark face to face. Because when we leave this world, we can take nothing with us except our love, our prayers, and our good deeds. Before the grandeur and magnificence of God, we are small and insignificant. Before the love of God, we are larger than life and so important to Him. So each one of us goes through the passageway told death to share our story with God and then to be welcomed into the other side of life, eternal life. So as we look back upon his life, we see Marty Barnes, a man whose love for his family, the city of Patterson, and his unwavering commitment to serve the people of the city with his own heart and soul, revealed the genuineness of his generosity for the welfare of everyone. I remember back in 1969 when I served as a young priest at a lady rose when Pat Bainer, I believe, was a mayor. How Marty's parents came faithfully to Mass every week, praying with profound faith for the family. Every single week, and sometimes more than once or twice a week, I was so deeply edified by them. We all know that Marty had a strong determination to promote and respect the human rights of all people. It was truly a most dedicated advocate of true justice for everyone. Marty strongly believed and endeavored to fulfill the words spoken by Pope Paul VI on his address to the UN, December 8, 1971. The Pope said, If you want peace, you must work for justice. If you want peace, you must work for justice. And body and body and his daily life, these words. When Molly ran for mayor for the first time, as we know, he ran unopposed. He was the first African American mayor in the city of Patterson. I had the privilege of giving the invitation at a swearing in ceremony as mayor of our city. Everyone in the city loved Marty. He loved Patterson. He said, not do enough to help everyone who lived in the city. As a mayor, he had an open door policy. He made himself available to everyone. And whenever I told him, it would return my souls as promptly as possible and listen to my concern. He gave himself most generously to listen to everyone who spoke to him and even do his very best to fulfill the request of those who sought his counsel and assistance. He championed housing for the poor, for he himself 
experience poverty. His intelligence and many gifts enable him to achieve a level of success for himself and for his family. It truly really fulfilled the words of the Lord. I have come not to be served, but to serve. And by these words, my lived his life. I have come not to be served, but to serve. Marty always had a warm welcome for everyone, a beautiful smile on his face. And whenever he met him, he would say, How are you feeling? It shows how he cared for people. His word was his bond. It was a true gentleman, a man of his word with an understanding heart. And now he loves his wife and him, their children, Gregory, Marcus, Antoinette, and their children. He loved his brothers, Tyrone, and Marty so much. His wife, children, great children, his entire family with the apple of his eye and the life of his life. Marty combined justice and compassion. In his life, he fulfilled the words of St. James. Chapter 2, verses 14. For the judgment, for the judgment is merciless to one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And to all the young people that cross his path, it strongly encourages them to put their minds and hearts to developing the gifts and talents they have received from God. To get a good education, to become good people, law abiding citizens, and with great and wonderful and fatherly advice he gave to so many young people. At the race yesterday afternoon, speaking with, to Bob Grant, the spokesman for the city of Madison, from January 1977 to July 2002, Bob shared with me some of the great accomplishments under the leadership of our mayor, Marty Barnes. And Bob Grant said, Marty was my friend. I consider it a privilege to work with him. And he said, at the outset of his administration, Mayor Barnes made commitments to, one, bring the people of Paris together to work to face the problems of the city. Two, clean up the city of Paris. Three, we're to ensure a safe city and reorganize the police department from a reactive department to a progressive and proactive institution. And four, stabilize taxes. Paris is a city of broad diversity and wide ethnic representation. Mayor Barnes reached out to all segments of the city to bring people together in his attempt to rebuild and revitalize the city. Only working together can we face the problems of the city, Mayor Barnes said. There is no blind or white or Hispanic way to fill a bad hole or clean up a neighborhood. So cleaning up the city was also a goal of a mayor and a major 
drivers. First, the mayor hired 25 10 men. The first class of dinners, the three of the same dinners and thirds, by the use of first rooms and shovel. The Department of Public Works put down material and empty containers as needed. And the state, such a major thrust of the cleanup campaign was the re revitalization of the street cleaning program using heavy equipment. Street sweepers on a regular basis, like homeowners expecting friends. Mayor Barnes said, we are making sure our house is clean, clean before our guests come, before our friends come. In most cities of the city of Madison, we're three months to leave. And residents were excited about this program. Relation between the Madison Police Department and its residents were in need of improvement for some time. And Somali actively addressed the issue by working to restructure the police department to make it a proactive department rather than a reactive one. And our residents want to see a police cruiser or patrol frequently so as to enjoy a sense of security in their homes and neighborhoods, he says. Residents deserve a strong police department dedicated to safe, secure neighborhoods who serve the citizens with respect and courtesy. Fiscal stability was the key to rebuilding Patterson, and the mayor worked hard to stabilize the past rate which threatened to run out of control. And so under Mayor Barnes administration, there was no municipal tax increase for Patterson for four straight years. And so Marty Barnes created a rising sense of progress and prosperity for the city of Patterson. And for that, and for many other things, we thank you, Mayor Barnes. And so now my has entered eternal life. And what is eternal life? Hmm. Jesus affirms, this is eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and the one whom you have sent, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is seeing God face to face. So as Christians, one of our beliefs is that death is not what it seems. It's not a closing door, but an opening door. Not an end, but a beginning. The beginning of a new and better kind of life, made possible at the moment the tomb was found empty and Christ was risen from the dead. He had not been abandoned by his father after all, and neither are we. Catherine Burton wrote a book about Nathaniel Hawthorne entitled Sorrow Built a Bridge. Sorrow Built a Bridge. Christ's death and resurrection built a bridge between heaven and earth for all of us. And so Marty has traveled over the bridge and Jesus has brought him to the dwelling place that is prepared for him. It is a million of saints to the bonds of love and prayer we span that bridge from earth to heaven. And a fitting tribute for Marty 
I want to share with you the words of Mother Teresa of Santana about love. Mother Teresa says, spread love everywhere you go. First of all, in your own house. Spread love to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your next door neighbor. Let no one ever talk to you without leaving you better and happier. These are the expression of God's kindness, kindness in your face, kindness in your smile, kindness in your warm feeling. And more it was the expression of love to his family and to all of us. I'm sure that my you want me to thank all of you, especially his wife Diane, his children, Red, Marcus, and Jeanette, the entire family and friends, for all the love that you lavished upon him throughout his life. It will be forever grateful to you for your love, your prayers, your friendship, and your support. So in the midst of our sorrow, let us remember God's promise to the prophet Isaiah. Thou will wipe away everything from their faces. And on that day, as what we said, Behold our God, behold our God to whom I look to be saved. Let us rejoice and let us be glad that he has saved me. In a loving farewell message, thank Almighty saying to each one of us, Dream not, nor speak to me with tears, but laugh and talk to me as though I were beside you. I love you so. It was that in heaven to you. We respond to Almighty, Almighty, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be over the Shabbat, and until we meet again, may God hold you, and the power of his hand. Mary, we love you, the people of Paris will love you, we thank you, and we miss you, and we shall see you again. Amen. Amen. Christ is son from death, but comforts we are here to save his people living in death. Please respond, Lord, hear our prayer. Our brother Marty was given the promise of eternal life. Baptism. Lord, give him communion with your saints forever. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Marty gave the bread of eternal life, the body of Christ. Raise him up, Lord, on the last day. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. We pray for our brothers and sisters, our relatives, for all who are close to us and good to us. Lord, give them the reward of your, their goodness. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have died in the hope of rising again. Welcome them, Lord, into the light of your presence. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for all who are gathered here to worship in faith. Lord, make us one in your kingdom. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer for dear brother and sisters. Forgive them for their sins and bring them to the fullness of your salvation. We have stayed through Christ our Lord. Amen. And after the of the 30 years to be found in the Basin of the Church, we saw that a video and I have seen. Please bring the better mind to the altar. You may be seated.
my sisters and brothers, that the spirit of this, our sacrifice, may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Martin, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving Savior may find in him a merciful judge. We ask you this, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right is truly right and just our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In Him the hope of blessed resurrection is gone. To those saddened by the certainty of thine may be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended, and when this earthly body turns to dust, an eternal dwelling place is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels, archangels, with thrones and dominations, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we send the hymn of his glory as for that end we are slain.
word of God for the channels of salvation. Three times that you have us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Only we pray the partaking of the body of God is Christ, who may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread out throughout the world. Bring her to the oneness of charity, together with our open and existing official officers and for the church. Remember your servant, Lord, whom, from whom you call today, from this world to reason, to yourself, for that human who are in very previous son in death and case, may he be one with you in this resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the old of restoration and all who have died in your mercy. Remember them in your life of place. Have mercy on us all, we pray. That with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have been throughout the ages, may merit to be poor heirs to be still alive and May praise and glory of you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, of the Almighty Father, and in the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
When my way grows, grows dream, precious Lord, linger.
Lawrence family is, is very proud of my father. Not only for the admirable things that he's done, but also for wonderful people he put in our lives. All of you have helped shut the numbers off. And showed us my father, considered you family.
This is what I want to do. Be happy. No, enjoy it as a lot of us. And create us to be happy and love and joy. And you know, to embrace each one as he created. We are a child of God. We are a smile of him. We are beautiful. Okay, there is no one, no one, no one in this world that he created that are different than one of us. We are unique in his eyes. And money, I know him pretty much. You know why? Because you know what I know a person is holy, okay, and wonderful, when he does not have to be looking as an actor in front of everybody, when he does prayer of his own. On the Easter Sunday, or Easter uh, ritual, when everybody was done, he will come, he used to live down there, he will come and by the fountain, by this most fountain, he will he will sit there or hats up there he will just to pray. When everybody was done or practically done, he would sit there to pray. And I remember that teacher in staff who, you know, in my heart, I said, this is very holy. And this is the first time I see, I don't know, a man, a politician, a mayor, or someone praying like I've never seen before anyone else. I see this to pray with God, I come here. I guess it won't have my money at that time. I don't think so. So I asked God for a blessing that He gave us. And for what we see as she did, it is true. Everybody was equal to Him. And for Him, He was a blessing for God for us. May God bless Him. And may He pray for us and this is so they all become one that Jesus for us. God bless. This is the end of the morning. We have told us first our first for him. The day of sadness is spent in our home. One day we shall joyfully live in him in the love of Christ, which transfers all things, destroys even death itself. May my dear peace, may he be with God, may he be with the living God. May he be with the Lord of God, may he be in God's hands. May he sleep in peace, may he live in peace, may he be with the name of God in his way, may he live with God now and in their judgment, may he live with God, may he live in eternal life, may he live in peace of the Lord, may he live forever in peace with God in peace. At the end of this conversation, Please respond, Lord, save your people. By your coming as man, Lord, save your people. By your birth, Lord, save your people. By your baptism and fasting, Lord, save your people. By your sufferings and cross, Lord, save your people. By your death and burial, Lord, save your people. By your rising to your life, Lord, save your people. By your returning glory to the Father, by your gift of the Holy Spirit, by your coming and death and glory, Lord, Father, into your hands with the men of the morning, we are confident that we will all live joy in Christ, it will be raised to life on the last day and live with Christ forever. We thank you for the blessings that you gave in this life to show your Father is there for all of us and the fellowship which is ours with the saints and Jesus Christ. Lord, hear our prayer. Why is never going to go into paradise and help us to suffer each other with the assurance of our faith until we have risen Christ and have you and above forever. We ask to this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Eternal rest, bring to the glory of Lord, let the Christ of us and upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. May his soul and all the souls for the faith of the Lord and the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. And now let us taste a brother body to his place of rest.
Marty Barnes. And do you have any history in Patterson? Uh, born and raised there, spent my entire life here. What are some of the things that you've seen in your lifetime right here in the city of Patterson? Oh my gosh, I can go on for hours. You know, just talking about some of the things that have happened in this city through this educational system, the, the community itself and the rising and falling of different things. Uh, it's been numerous and probably too numerous to mention. What are some of the things that in your childhood growing up that you were able to focus on about Patterson? Well, basically when I was growing up, it was a whole different uh, environment in Patterson. Uh, the racism, the segregation, you know, people always thought that that was just a thing of the South. And it wasn't just a thing of the South. We had it right here in, uh, in New Jersey as well, and particularly here in Patterson. Uh, so that I remember, you know, going to school, doing some of the, uh, the situations. I wanted to take an academic course when I first got to high school, and they wouldn't allow that because uh, blacks were not allowed to take academic courses. I had to take a, uh, a manual training course dealing with carpentry or, or uh, mechanics or something like that. They wouldn't allow us to do that. And as things uh, moved forward and as you grew up, did you see any significant, significant changes in Patterson? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, we saw how things started growing, how things started coming. And one of the, the first... Uh, Excuse me. As things moved along and started to change, uh, did you see any significant changes uh, other than what happened when you were growing up? I think, you know, one of the initial parts, one of the initial changes in the, uh, in the city of Patterson, and what got people motivated was the whole civil rights movement and the civil rights action. That tend to get people really excited and people wanted to fight for change. Whereas before that, that wasn't relevant. People just accepted what was going on. Well, what was happening that people needed to fight? What was happening? What was going on? Everything. The educational system wasn't working for our kids. They weren't allowing our young people, you know, to, uh, to grow or expand within system. You know, uh, the, the recreation department, you know, you can only play sports in the city of Patterson if you did certain things or if you followed their rules or regulations. Yeah, I can remember walking to Eastside uh, Park to, uh, to play ball, and we had to walk down Broadway. If we, we veered off on any of those side streets, or whatever the police would stop us you know well uh, you had police that uh, you know that just you know came down on uh, on all people of color back in those days there weren't a lot of latinos around it was more uh, you know blacks but it was uh, it was a serious uh, significant thing then you had all of the other numbers going you had the uh, the drugs the uh, uh, you know uh, the number runners and that whole situation going, you know, and so that created a whole different environment in the city. And what did you attribute those uh, civil right things happening to? What did you attribute the cause? What was the cause of the problem? It was a system, a system that, uh, you know, that negated uh, people of color. You know, they were, it was a system that just didn't work with people, that didn't try to help people, didn't try to do anything for people. Uh, they felt that you should be acceptable of uh, whatever they gave you, you know, as opposed to striving or fighting for something more or better. And do you have a memorable moment growing up in Patterson that when you reflect on your years that you can go back and say, I remember when? Probably got a few of those, but uh, Martin's coming to Patterson was probably the, the thing that changed my life. That's the thing that really got me involved in politics and government, you know, knowing that there could be some change, you know. Uh, so in my life, that was probably one of the, uh, the biggest things, you know, that, uh, that I can, uh, you know, point to. And my father's involvement. My father just wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, and uh, he always stood up and, uh, you know, and fought and challenged things and what have you. But he was also a part of the system. When Martin came to Patterson, you were about 19 years old. That's correct. And um, prior to that, leading up to his visit here, what were some of the things that was happening? What was going on here in Patterson? Probably the biggest problems were police brutality, you know, uh, the uh, not a good recreation system. Uh, the politics uh, was... Uh, uh, you know, just ignored people of color, you know, those kinds of things. The system just didn't work. The city wasn't working for uh, people. And like I said, what you had to do is that you just had to be quiet. You weren't allowed to, you know, think out loud or come out public or say things because things would happen to you.
Were there any barriers as far as where people could go and couldn't live and couldn't walk in Patterson? Oh, absolutely. Outside of the, uh, the fourth ward and the first ward, you were very limited. You could not live in the east side section. Nobody would sell you a home. You couldn't rent a home. You know, you couldn't go into the east side section. And the second ward, you know, was a place that, uh, you know, uh, was lily white for many years. You know, but those are areas that you just did not touch. And, of course, you couldn't go outside of the city of Patterson. And growing up, when you saw all of these things happening, what did you do to make a change? What was your first, what was the first thing you did to make a change in Patterson as far as civil rights was concerned? Well, the first thing I did is I started a tenants association, you know, the Patterson Tenants Association. And what we did is that we got uh, people together because these landlords, back in those days, we had these slum landlords. And they were just taking advantage of people doing whatever they wanted to do with people. So we started a tenants association to go out and fight for tenants' rights. I reached out to a couple of lawyers. I got lawyers to make commitments to go to court and fight for these people and challenge, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the system as it was. So that's where I really started. I started in tenants' rights. And what did you do after that? After tenants' rights, uh, we got into a major battle with the, uh, the city over the recreation program, and uh, I uh, wrote a law called the rent leveling law, and the rent leveling law was d uh, designed to protect tenants. I got into so much, you know, uh, so many problems. Tom Rooney was the mayor at the time. And uh, I went in to uh, talk to Rooney about having this pass, and he threw me out of the office. He told me that Patterson wasn't big enough for the both of us. So the whole political structure you know, was just vehemently opposed. So we just started a battle, and uh, we went to the, the Board of Aldermen, who really had very limited power back in those days. And uh, we were able to get the, uh, the rent living law passed through the Board of Aldermen. And were there any official positions for African Americans uh, during that time? Were there, did they hold any positions here in Patterson? We had uh, one, we might have had two people on the Board of Aldermen. But like I said, back in those days, the Board of Aldermen was more like uh, licenses, that they approved licenses and, and things like that. That's what their mainstay was. Uh, but uh, no, even the political people in the community, like in the Fourth Ward here, uh, you know, you had a little a guy called Jimmy Cleveland, you know, uh, who uh, didn't even live in this area, but he basically ran all of the politics in the, uh, in the Fourth Ward. And at some time, you became mayor of this great city. When was that? Oh, that was in uh, 97. But before that, we, uh, I was the fourth ward council person, you know, and then uh, I, uh, I was elected to fourth ward as a city council. Then I got elected at large to the city council. Then I got elected from the third ward representing the, uh, the city before I became the mayor. So it was a long process. We're talking about 30 years of energy and time. And was there any uprising from some of the people who might have believed in segregation when you became mayor? What happened then? Well, by that time, I think that uh, we had started getting things moving in the right direction. You know, there were many years before I became the mayor that we, uh, we were getting rights. We were fighting for justice and things like that. So we had a good core of people. So things were already starting to, you know, by the time I, I became uh, mayor in, in uh, 97, things were moving. In 1968, what was going on then? Oh, my goodness. 1968, uh, the city was in a shambles. You know, uh, you had all of these different sources that were out there. You know, anything you could imagine, you know, the mafia, the gangs, the, all of that kind of stuff, that was prevalent in the city of Patterson. And was there a reason for that? Uh, inner city. You know, it was, uh, I don't know if it's any different in, in Patterson than it was in any other inner city. You know, but it was inner city, and those are the kinds of things that happen in, in inner city. When you don't have jobs for people, and you don't have opportunities for people to move ahead, what they do is they tend to survive in the best way they know how. And most of the time, that happens in the street. In the street at that time, a uh, number of riders were many. What happened? What, they, they protected the uh, people who lived in the inner city. What happened? How did that come about? Let me tell you something. The number runners really did a, a major service in the community. Number one, the number runners wouldn't allow drugs in the inner city. 
because they didn't want the uh, the problems from the uh, the police department or what have you. So they did not allow you know uh, drugs to come into the community. What really changed the number runners was when they legalized uh, you know numbers in the state. You know that's what kind of you know took out all of the uh, the number runners. You know, because then the state started getting the money as opposed to the people in the community. But the beautiful thing about the number runners is that they took care of their people as well. You know, if somebody was having a hard time, if they lost their job or whatever, the number guys would get together and take care of that family. Somebody died, they'd give money to the, to the wife, they'd pay for the funerals. So even though the number runners were considered a negative thing, you know, in reality, they served a purpose in, in the community. And when the state became the number runner, you know, that changed everything all over because none of that money ever came back. So do you think that that was a time that all this stuff, the unrest started happening in Patterson? I think it would happen even before that. I think in Patterson it goes back into the 50s. You know, just from talking to different people and, and hearing what people were talking about when I was coming up, you know, I think all of that unrest was happening then, but it didn't really reach its goal until the, uh, the 1960s. Uh, the late 60s is when things started getting on fire. You know, you had the, the black unity movement, you had people being proud to be black. You know, uh, it, I mean, it changed everything, the way they dressed, the way they communicated. You know, blackness, you know, wasn't something to hide from anymore. It was something to embrace. And so that's when the movement really started changing in the late 60s, and that went into the 70s. And who was the mayor at that time? Uh, you had a couple of different mayors. You had uh, uh, Pat Kramer, uh, and you also had uh, Frank Graves. During Kramer's term, uh, that was in 1968, what was going on then? Uh, there was a lot of hope that something was going to happen because Pat Kramer was a young guy and, and they figured that he would make changes in the city of Patterson and, and bring some, uh, some things alive in the city. You know, uh, prior to, uh, to Pat Kramer, there were uh, always a lot of issues and you didn't have, uh, you know, people of color in good, solid jobs and what have you. And he did take a few blacks and put them into his administration. So he did, you know, try to do something, but you can, it wasn't about people of color. It was, a, it was about uh, them taking care of their own political uh, choices. What were you doing when Martin Luther King came to Patterson? Uh, I was standing outside. You know, my father was inside. You know, I was standing outside. The, the place was just surrounded with people. You know what I mean? And you couldn't get inside. You know, and, uh, you know, just the thought of him coming, and all I wanted to do was see him. I just wanted to see him, whether he was coming or going, I didn't care. I just wanted to see him and put my eyes on him. And what do you remember about this church that day? I think the excitement of what was happening. You know, to me, you know, and I can only speak for myself when it comes to this, but that's when my, my fight started. That's when I decided I needed to get involved and do something. You know, when Martin was here and seeing all of the things that were happening and what have you and seeing the people that are around, you know, this church was the epitome of that. You know, what they, what they did by bringing Martin here, uh, the Reverend Lagarde got people excited, got people motivated. You know, and you know Reverend Lagarde was a very powerful speaker. You know, so he was a very powerful speaker in and unto himself. You know, so it was, a, it was this church in the middle of the ghetto, you know, on Governor Street. It was this church that really brought things alive, and it changed the whole future of the city of Patterson coming out of this building. And that day, what was your excitement? What did you feel just knowing that Dr. King was going to be here that day? Oh, just the idea of knowing he was a national figure, you know, uh, he was, uh, you know, standing up for the rights of people. You know, what I can remember of all of the marches and things of the time, you know, I was probably more of a, a, of a Malcolm X guy because I wanted to fight back, you know, uh, whereas Martin was saying, turn the other cheek. It took me a while to get to that point. But once coming here and seeing how many people were supporting him and following him and, and uh, listening to his every word, you know, that was the thing that I said, you know, the answer to this, the solution to this is politics, getting involved in changing government as it's working, because that was the only solution to fixing the city. What was the atmosphere? Can you give me a, an overview of what it was like that day? For about a week and a half, 
that's all you would hear no matter where you went to the barber shop to the you know to the grocery store you know in the in the schools in the streets everybody was talking about Martin coming that day there was just an excitement you know in town and a lot of people were talking about taking off from work those who were working nighttime jobs or whatever they were going to take off from work to come down here to see Martin yeah, and, and it was just a total excitement all in the community, in the streets. People were really eager and excited. On the other hand, the establishment itself, the system itself, was very upset, very worried, very concerned. You know, so they packed the place with police officers. They had people all, all around, you know, trying to make sure that no riot was going to happen or something like that. And it had nothing to do with that. And the people weren't here even thinking about that. Because what you had is you had the, the middle people. You didn't have the young kids. They weren't here. You know, and I was probably one of the youngest here, and I was like 18 or 19 at the time. But what you had is you had the, the people that were working every day, the people that were out in the, uh, in the neighborhoods, out in the streets, you know, and you also had the, the, uh, the people that, you know, were concerned about their community. They were the ones that were here. They were the ones that, uh, you know, wasn't, that's the real people. And standing outside, what did you hear? I didn't hear a whole bunch. You know, I heard, uh, you know, because they had, uh, you know, a speaker system outside, but it wasn't a good one, you know. But, uh, you know, like I said, I was out there just to see him, you know. And, of course, you hear all of the talk from the, uh, the people that were there. And, uh, you know, everybody was, t you know, you were getting the, the loss of what was happening. Oh, Martin just showed up. He went in that side door you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it was just, uh, it was an excitement. It was a buzz. It was just, it kept going. It kept getting louder and louder and louder. Were you able to glimpse Dr. King? I finally saw him when he was coming out. Yeah, and he stopped and he waved at the people and he started walking and shaking hands. But, you know, the people were very concerned, so they whisked him off. You know, but uh, that was the, uh, the thing. I think when it really hit home was uh, after he left Patterson, you know, and we all know what happened to Martin. That's when it really hit home that we were blessed, that we were honored here in the city of Patterson, you know, for one of his last visits to be here. And to me, that was a message. What message was that? It's time to get involved. It's time to stand up and fight for your rights. You know, it's time to be in control of your own destiny. You know, and that's what the message was to me, is that you don't sit back and allow people to do whatever they want to do. You know, you stand up, you fight for your rights, you challenge the system, and you force people to give you what is your God-given right to have. And the day Dr. King left Patterson, what was the emotion? What was the feeling of the crowd? Oh, goodness, they followed him. You know, they were following the car. There were all kinds of vehicles that were uh, around that were actually going to follow the car. People were walking in the path of the car and what have you. And when the people came from inside of the building and they came out and they started talking about the message, that's when things really, you know, flurried up because people were excited. People are full of energy and everybody wanted to stand up and do something. Four days later, when Dr. King was assassinated, when you learned that news, what went through your mind? What happened? The first thing I did is that, uh, you know, tough guy that I was, I shed a tear. You know, I mean, I was really upset and offended by it, you know, because I knew what it was. You know, racism has reared its ugly head, you know, in, uh, throughout my life. And I knew that that's what that was. That was pure racism that went out to, uh, you know, to do something evil to a man that was preaching nonviolence. It made no sense to me. But it galvanized my inner self, and it made me want to stand up and fight harder. You know, and uh, that was what I got out of it after I thought about it and saw what was happening and, and all of the emotion of the time and what was going through the community, through the city, was just amazing you know, because people were just beside themselves. You know, but that kind of woke up the inner me that says, it's time, it's showtime, it's time to do battle. And what did the inner you do to make a difference in this city after Dr. King left? Started getting involved. That's when I started the Tenants Association. I started the, uh, you know, a recreation program for inner city kids where we had basketball and baseball programs. And we started just putting things uh, together. And uh, from those things and the fights that we were having there caused me to run for office. So the first time I, I ran for office, that had to be, I guess it was uh, 70. You know, when uh, the first time I ran, uh, you know, for office, I was a young kid, 
And uh, we ran at that time, this area was not the fourth ward, it was the sixth ward. You know, and I ran uh, here against a uh, person called Rita Avalo, who was an incumbent. And we ran against her. And I lost by one vote. And we showed that her father, Rita Avalo's father, voted twice. And so we tried to challenge it in the system, and you know we hired lawyers and all of that. But back in those days, we didn't have any money. I, you know, I had reached out to a friend of ours, the Cornish brothers, and one of the Cornishes was a lawyer. And so we tried to challenge the system. Then, you know, uh, nothing ever happened with it. She went on and uh, you know served in the sixth ward, and that's when the fight for the change of government happened. And uh, when you fought, you your family were longtime Pattersonians. Yes. Um, that were involved in the community. Correct. Um, what did they do to continue that involvement when you became involved? Oh, my father encouraged me all the way, you know, and uh, they were right there, you know, helping us, supporting us, turning us on to different people. You need to talk to this one, you need to talk to that one. My father would be making phone calls or what have you. You have to remember back in those days, I was a kid, I was young, I was like 20 years old. And so people, you know, never saw any young people getting out and getting involved, you know. And uh, so I was talking to folks that were in their 40s and their 50s and what have you and convincing them that a young knucklehead with a, a full beard and, a, and an afro, you know, was serious about uh, doing something. And back in those days, I wore dashikis, you know, so it was a little different uh, message. And um, going back then and looking at now, what difference do you see? Do you see a difference? There is a difference. You know, I think that there are more opportunities now. The educational system, uh, you know, has started coming together a little better than what it was back in those days. You know, uh, our young kids can get into colleges and, and uh, things like that. You know, uh, there are differences. Uh, people have, uh, can move any place they want in the city of Patterson. They can live wherever they want. There were job opportunities. You know, our recreation program, you know, had, uh, had gotten stronger. So, yeah, a lot of the things that we fought for, you know, I think uh, did happen. Uh, did they happen as well as they could have? No. Um, am I totally pleased with uh, what has happened? No, I don't know if I'll ever be pleased until I have utopia. You know, but uh, at least there has been a, a change. 30 years of my life that's gone into doing all this fighting, uh, I question how effective I've really been. Why is that? 30 years. It took 30 years to get some of these changes, 30 years to make things happen. Yeah, you know, that's a lot of time. You know, and uh, then you got to sit back and say to yourself, was it worth all of the time and the energy sitting in people's living rooms, walking up and down streets, talking to people that get to this point? When I first got involved, people of color were voting at less than 25% every election. I worked for all those years and we got it up to 55%. You know, now, everybody says, oh, that's a major improvement. You've doubled it. But the point is, it wasn't 100. It wasn't 90. Yeah, and that's what it should be. You know, people need to realize that, you know, if you don't get involved in your government, you don't have a say. You don't have a right to even communicate or, or talk negative about anything. You know, because you're not involved in the thing that's going to take control of your own destiny. And you have to f stand up and fight for your rights. Nobody's going to fight for your rights unless you stand up and fight. You know what I mean? And I don't know. It's taken me 30 years. I don't know if I got that message across to enough people. I mean, enough to do some good. You know, enough to make some changes, enough to have, uh, you know, people of, of color in elected positions, but not enough to take total control of our destiny. And that's always been my goal. How would you like to see your destiny revived? How would you like to see your thoughts on history carried out? I, I view things in the community, and the community tells me that. You know, I think that if the community was doing the kinds of things, neighbors taking care of neighbors, everybody looking out for one another, you know, the old saying is that you are your brother's keeper. You know, I mean, that needs to be a, a, a thing that goes across the board. Everybody looking out for one another, everybody standing up for what's right. You know, that's, you know, w would be my ultimate goal. But like I said before, utopia has always been my dream, and we all know that'll never happen, but that doesn't stop the fight. 
Do you think history plays an important part in the revitalization of this city? Absolutely. History is the key to what makes uh, you know, a city come alive. If you don't know where you've been, how are you going to figure out where you're going? Yeah, and you need to tell people their history and let them understand their history because that helps build the future. You know, same thing, you know, uh, the history will also show mistakes. And by showing those mistakes, you know not to do those things again. So history is really important. You have to open up people's eyes. You have to let them see you know, what's going on and let them see how great it is. The city of Patterson is a great city. The history goes all the way back to the beginning of this country. You know, and if you follow the, uh, the history of this city, it's still happening even up until today. You know, but it's growing, it's building, and we've got to keep that history alive. If it's important for us to talk about the silk city and, and the silk industry and all of that, it's just as important to talk about how people of color got their lives in order. You know? This was the beginning. This was the start of it all. You know, when Martin came here is when it all began, when it all started, what got people the most excited. So this is the, uh, the epitome of, uh, of what our history was and where the movement started and came from, right here in this church. And how can we maintain that? How can we keep a grasp on that and see that that memory is kept alive? We've got to get everybody who's involved, the entire community, all involved and standing up and saying, this is what we want. You know, we had the Underground Railroad site that, you know, has been, you know, uh, messed around, you know, and, and we don't have a significant thing there. And that was something that was real important to the city of Patterson. We can't let them take this, too. We've got to stand up and say, look, all right, you mess us up on that. We're coming back for that, you know, but right now we need to deal with this. So we might have to work backwards a little bit by saving this church, by showing, you know, uh, its significance to the city of Patterson, to the people of Patterson, and then go back and, and uh, get our other site as well. Do you feel any emotion when you come through these doors and you reflect on its history? This church means a lot to me. Uh, because of my political involvement. You know, Reverend Lagarde was very supportive of this young kid, you know, that uh, had no background and no history. And so I've been coming in and out of this church for so many years, you know, and uh, talking to the people and seeing the people. So, you know, it always has, uh, you know, significance to me, you know, because number one is right around the corner from my house or where I used to live. You know, and secondly, because of uh, what it meant to me. I mean, the, the Reverend Lagarde let me use the basement to have political meetings with people. You know, things like that. Never charged me a dime, never asked for anything. You know, he was being supportive. And, and you know, so you don't forget stuff like that. So this church definitely has a historical place in the city of Paris. Absolutely does. You know, if for no other reason, you know, than the, the, the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. If for no other reason, at least that. But I think it even goes beyond that because of the kinds of programs and things that Lagarde had put into place while uh, he was the pastor here.